Hello, and welcome to our continuing conversation about uh, spirituality, uh, about growing in relationship with the sacred and the holy, and by extension, when we talk about sacredness and holiness, we also mean growing into a maturity within your human experience. It's impossible to be a holy person if you're not a mature human person. Maturity of humanity and holiness of life go hand in hand. That doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you've got everything figured out. Uh, doesn't mean that you always make the right choices or the right decisions. Uh, but it does mean that you uh, are in relationship with God in a healthy way, that you're in relationship with yourself in a very healthy way. You're in relationship with others in a very healthy way. And finally, you're in relationship with all of creation. So the last couple of days, we've talked about learning how to be in relationship with yourself. And then yesterday, we talked about learning how to be in relationship uh, more maturely with others. We talked about how that leads us to a compassionate response to life, not only for ourselves, but then as we experience compassion, we reach out to others with compassion. And compassion is a much more mature choice than anger or jealousy or revenge or justice even. Uh, compassion speaks from a place within yourself, a deep place of conviction within yourself when you become more and more and more aware of the fact that all that you have, everything that you hope for, all that means anything in your life comes to you as a gift from God. And the God who is compassionate and loving to you asks you to return that same compassion and love. Today, we're going to talk about our relationship with God. And I'm going to use a quote again from New Seeds of Contemplation. Uh, and this quote, when you first hear it, might scare you a bit. But don't let it scare you. Just kind of uh, pay attention to what it says and let it just kind of sit with you. Uh, but don't get overly anxious about it because it is, it is quite ambitious what it's talking about. But as we continue with our presentation this morning, we'll see how it's actually played out in real life. So this is what New Seeds of Contemplation Thomas Merton said about our relationship with God. This is what it means to seek God. You withdraw from illusion and pleasure, from worldly anxieties and desires, from the works that God does not want. From a glory that is only human display. To keep your mind free from confusion. In order that your liberty may always be at the disposal of God's will. To entertain silence in your heart. And listen for the voice of God. And then to wait in peace and in emptiness and oblivion of all things. And I told you that that sounds really, really scary. Uh, it sounds almost impossible. And it is impossible if we try to do it ourselves. It's not impossible as we cooperate with the Spirit of God. It's one of those things that we do with God's grace and God's life and God's love, but we do it gradually as we grow and we develop. We begin to withdraw from those things because we've already talked about growing in maturity with self and others. So we begin to withdraw from illusion. We begin to draw from distractions. Uh, we try not to be anxious. We try not to let our desires overwhelm us. Uh, and disappoint us uh, and make us feel less than what we really are. We try not to spend our life reaching for something that does not, when all is said and done, mean anything. But rather what we try to do is we try to live our life in the way that God has created us. Uh, here's a little something, a little prayer 
that I find captures the idea of growing into a contemplative experience with God, but it puts the emphasis on the fact that God is in charge uh, and that our response to God's grace is to become who we are in our deepest sense, in our truest sense of self. So this is the way this particular prayer, as it turns out, unfolds. A robin pecks its way out of an egg. A bud blossoms into a rose. An acorn into an oak. A star forms out of the condensation of interstellar gases. Molten minerals cool into crystal patterns. For all created things, there is a way to be that is right for them. They become what they are meant to be. The seed planted within us that holds the code for our unique being is love. To know love in our lives, we must first claim our desire to be loved. And loving. This means dedicating ourselves to the source of love. And this is an act of consecration, an act of dedication to the Spirit of God. We can be dedicated to anything. For instance, we can be dedicated to a task. We can be dedicated to a cause. We can be dedicated to an idea. But we can only be consecrated to God. Consecrated means that we consciously participate in love, intentionally opening ourselves to accept and then express in our lives, our choices, and our actions the gift of love. It we try, requires that we trust more in grace than in our personal capabilities. <clears throat> it calls for an attitude of willingness a giving of ourselves to a power greater than our own. It's a way of life that acknowledges that God is the source of life, of grace. And God is the person who calls us into life and grace. Understanding that it is God who calls and we respond, that's what keeps us focused on what is truly important and what is truly urgent in our lives. So can you imagine uh, a robin trying to figure out how they're going to get out of the egg? No, it's impossible. The fear, the anxiety, uh, all the stuff that would be involved in that would make it impossible, would freeze the robin into a state of inability to respond. Or imagine an acorn trying to figure out how it's going to be a tree. Again, there's the absurdity of it. Well, when we talk about our relationship with God and we talk about trying to withdraw from illusion and pleasure, trying to become the person that God wants us to be, we can become overwhelmed. But it's better to just simply trust. Trust that God, who has created us, will enable for us the journey. Now, instead of talking about all this stuff in this way, I thought I would perhaps give you the best example that we as Christians have. The best example that we as Christians have about how to respond to God, how to trust that God will lead us to where we need to be and to be inspired by the journey of another. And for Christians, the person who inspires us, who has shown us the way, is none other than the person of Jesus. Now, for this particular section, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. And it might cause some anxiety. It might cause some angst, if you will. 
among people who haven't spent a lot of time uh, thinking about historical Jesus or have not written or spent a lot of time writing or not writing, uh, reading uh, about the historical Jesus and archaeology and all the tremendous amount of biblical scholarship and constant study that goes into trying to understand better the historical Jesus. And it's far beyond our capabilities here this morning to uh, spend a lot of time in the story. But there are some parts of the story that illustrate how it is to be open to the experience of God's life and love, to respond to God's life and love wholeheartedly, even if you're not sure what it means. So imagine Jesus. Imagine the Jesus that we do not know. The Jesus who spent 30 years, what traditionally we call his hidden life. Of course, as Jesus was experiencing what we call his hidden life, it wasn't hidden to him. It was his experience in the time and place in which he was called and placed by God. So it was not an experience of hiding. It was an experience of living. And that experience of living from all of the archaeological clues that we have been given, what we know about the time of Jesus, about the place where Jesus was, the people who Jesus would have called contemporaries, the situation in which Jesus found himself, we can assume, and of course this is only speculation, because we do not have a written record, of those 30 years. We do not have CNN or Fox News reporting to us what happened. Uh, that was not the concern or the capabilities of the people of that time. But what we do know from the archaeological record is that if Jesus was a man who was centered in Nazareth, then he was a person who lived in pretty extreme poverty. Because when you take the archaeological evidence of Nazareth from the time of Jesus and you dig through what is left from that century in what Nazareth once was, there's not much there. In fact, the archaeology suggests that it was an extremely poor encampment, perhaps more as a temporary encampment than a permanent encampment. That doesn't mean that there wasn't houses or there doesn't mean that there wasn't places that people could relax or even pray. Uh, those things are very popular even in temporary places. But it was never imagined as a place of permanence. It wasn't imagined as a great city or a great gathering place. It existed for a singular reason. One of the reasons it existed is because there was water available and there was land available, a very small amount of land available that could be harvested and planted. And it was also, and perhaps this was its strongest point, was off the beaten trail. So people didn't accidentally show up in Nazareth. You went deliberately. And the reason that was such a good thing was because then you didn't have to worry about encountering the people you didn't want to encounter. Especially, you didn't have to worry too much about encountering the oppressive army of Rome. And you didn't really have to spend much time worrying about encountering the representatives of the temple in Jerusalem, who were equally oppressive. You were able to live a, a simple life a life that was close to family and to friends, and by all the evidence, a life that was open to the possibility of being in communication with the Spirit of God. Because if anything, Nazareth was a place that was very silent. And in the solitude and the silence of Nazareth, it's not hard to imagine Jesus entering into dialogue with his heavenly father. 
and learning something about his relationship, what it meant to be the Son of God, what it meant to be the person that he was. He learned the lessons that he would later teach, the prayers that he would later pray, the experiences that he would later single out as essential and important. And he also formed the opinions and the judgments, some of which were opinions and judgments of the people of his day, of his time and his place. And others were those that stood in stark contrast to what people believed. And all of that later came for us, as we know. It came for us in the stories of the gospel. It came for us in the parables of Jesus. It came to us in the witness of his life. But all of it began in the quiet place called Nazareth. Now, what would people in Nazareth do off the beaten track? How would they live? How would they survive? Even places that were intended to be temporary have to have some sort of economy, some way of getting what you need. And it seems that perhaps one of the reasons Nazareth was where it was, was that it was very close to the city of Sepphoris. And Sepphoris was a city that had years earlier, long before Jesus was born, rebelled against Rome. And Rome had come and torn it down. But now, under King Herod, who was seeking to find favor with Caesar and the Romans, Sepphoris was undergoing a huge rebuilding project. Everything that you can imagine was being built in a city that was intended to impress. And you can imagine when there's a lot of construction going on and there's a lot of building going on, there's a lot of need for day laborers. And Nazareth was a reasonable walk away from Sepphoris. It was possible to walk into Sepphoris, work for the day, and return home in the evening. So perhaps that's what Jesus was doing. Again, we don't know. But despite the fact that Nazareth was isolated and off the beaten track, some of the central ideas of the people of Israel, the religious ideas of the people of Israel, nevertheless found their way to Nazareth. And one of the ideas that we know that Jesus had initially in the first part of his mission, in the first part of his ministry, was the belief that we would call the sudden, unannounced, and dramatic insertion by God into the world, where the people who had been oppressed would become free, and those who were the oppressors would be punished. This was a vision of the world that was held strongly by many, many people in Israel who were waiting for the coming Messiah who would set things right. One of the people who believed this very strongly, and we have the written record of his belief, is the man that today we call John the Baptist. And it seems, again, we have no written records about John the Baptist, but it seems that John preached daily the need to convert, the need to repent, and the need to change your life. And he baptized as a result of that belief. But why did you need to convert? Why was it so necessary? What was the relationship that was required? What was John trying to make happen? Well, it seems that John, as some other people in his day, believed that if they could form a faithful remnant, a remnant of people that God could see from his heavens, was just, was open to God's word, and faithful to the covenant, that might just provide the spark that was needed in order for God to intervene. So the Baptists, it seems, came up with a wonderful way to both encourage the people in their religious obligations and their religious thought and thinking, and at the same time try to build up this remnant. 
what he did was he had people come to the River Jordan, and they would enter the River Jordan on one side of the River Jordan, enter into the River Jordan, be baptized and emerged, cleansed, cleaned, and renewed on the other side of the River Jordan. He was enacting the great journey of Israel, the great journey of moving away from captivity, moving away from oppression that was experienced by the people in Egypt, going through the cleansing waters of the sea and emerging on the other side as people of the covenant. So daily, John the Baptist was building up the people of the covenant, those who were converted, those who were renewed, and those who waited anxiously for the return of God's Messiah. Why is all that important? Well, when we first meet Jesus, where do we meet him? When his hidden life is over and his public life begins, where do we meet him? We meet him at the River Jordan. We meet him at the place of baptism, where John the Baptist was calling people to repentance and conversion. We meet him at a place that was filled with activity, filled with energy, filled with anticipation that something wonderful was going to happen. And it was going to happen very, very soon. And Jesus presents himself to John the Baptist at the River Jordan. As we know, there was no need for Jesus to present himself as a person in need of conversion or in need of being reminded that he needed to live according to God's will. That seems to us and to him to be something that was obvious. But yet, but yet, Something happened. Something happened at the Jordan that became so dramatic and it provided a response from Jesus that seemed to be something that he had not prepared for, but rather that surprised him. He enters, as all the others do, into the river to be baptized by John, and when he emerges from the water, he hears the voice from the heavens that says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Dramatic. A moment of great invitation. A moment of grace. But it's also a moment, it seems to be at least, a moment that causes Jesus some level of perhaps anxiety, perhaps fear, perhaps uncertainty, surprise, who knows exactly. But Jesus emerges from the water, hears the voice that this is my beloved son, and he goes into the desert. To think about what he just heard, no less to wrestle with what it means to be the beloved Son of God. What does it mean? What is asked of him? How is he to respond? So it becomes, as we know, the pivotal moment in the life of Jesus, at least at the beginning of his ministry. Now, what does all this have to do about relationship with God? What does this have to do with learning to be open to the will of God? What does this have to do with changing your ideas, your attitudes, and your perceptions, and trying to live as God wants you to live? Well, it has everything to do with it. Because at the center of learning how to be in relationship with God is that we find our identity who we truly are in that experience, that intimate experience of God's life and grace. We discover who we are. Perhaps we do not hear a voice like Jesus did. But nonetheless, in the silence and in the solitude 
of trying to listen to God's will by paying not attention to illusions or all those things that distract us or those anxieties and the desires that consume us, but rather just trying to pay attention to the voice of God and not telling God what he should say, but rather listening to God. We can discover our true self. We can discover what God truly wants us to be and what God calls us to be. Not unlike Jesus, each and every one of us, as we enter into that relationship, as we enter into the River Jordan, as we enter into baptism, and as we emerge on the other side as cleansed and renewed people, what we're really called to do is enter that relationship with Jesus, enter that relationship with the Spirit, enter that relationship with the Father, by letting all the things that we think are important be stripped away from us. You don't need to go to God as the perfect father or as the perfect mother or as the perfect priest. You don't need to go to the spirit of God trying to find and celebrate your identity with God as the person who has their entire act together. None of those things are necessary. Those are all things that God already knows. You don't need to stand before God and tell God who you are. God already knows who you are. What you do need to hear, on the other hand, is from God the truth about who you are. And it has nothing to do with title. It has nothing to do with your work. It has nothing to do with your experience or the things that you think are important. It has everything to do with what God wants to tell you about yourself. And don't be surprised that when you hear God's voice speaking to you, as you strip away with God's help and grace all the things that you think that you have and that you need, don't be surprised if within the middle of all that you feel a little anxious, you feel a little fearful, you wonder what's left. Just think of the life of Jesus. The same thing happened to Jesus. What's left? Who am I if I'm not who I think I am? What does it mean that I'm the Son of God? The same thing happens to us as we enter deeper and deeper into our relationship with God. And so all those things that we develop, our maturity with ourself, our maturity with others, as it is with everything that we learn in the spiritual journey, the spiritual journey never ends. It always simply prepares us for the next moment. And the next moment is always something that's more powerful, more dramatic, more grace-filled than we possibly can imagine. And it always, despite the fear that we might have, the anxiety that we have, it always comes to us as grace. It always comes to us as blessing. And it always leads us to something more. Tomorrow we'll talk about our relationship with all of creation, and we'll talk about the unity that that creation experiences and celebrates, and how we play an important part in that unity. So may God bless us this day and always. Amen.